Hi, and welcome to The New Property Show. I'm Steve McManaman. In this program, we'll be hearing from Therese and Adele on what it takes to be a mortgage broker and how to buy a brand new home off the plan. Gary is back with his regular segment on wealth creation. Dax Stanley will be talking to us about how to create duplexes through knockdown and rebuilds. We'll be hearing from our regular panel, but first, Kerry, on how to create the best interior design. Hi, I'm Kerry Melbourne from Kerry Melbourne Interiors, and today I want to educate you on the common mistakes with property styling and styling your property. So the most common mistakes people make is they really don't know what they want. So they don't make a list and they actually uh, just impulse buy. And so they get home and they've got all this, this, these pieces and they've spent a lot of money on you know, beautiful sofas, but it's not the right colour and they're not pairing it with the right artwork. So when you've got a professional to help you, you're not wasting money. You're actually having someone to guide you. You are having that person um, you know, help you buy those right pieces and then we can come in, we can help you style it and it's perfect. And you have a beautiful space, it's been perfectly designed and you haven't got all this other inventory which you've just spent all this money on. So mistakes in styling is again, I would say 100% impulse buying. I mean, people really don't have the, the knowledge of what to buy. That's a big mistake. Uh, another mistake is I feel when people are styling is they're using the wrong colours. So they're using really bright, bold colours and which of those colours, what it does is it makes the space small. When you're choosing right tones, it really opens up these spaces. And you, it's very important that you work from a neutral and if you are choosing a colour like a navy or a beautiful coping green, it's really important that you cater that with the right colour rug if, you, if, if it's a sofa. You know, some people have these bright rugs and these bright pieces of um, inventory and it just doesn't work and it's just not a telling a story. Therese and Adele, amazing to have you on the new property show. Uh, Therese, you're a, basically a broker coach, is that correct? That is correct, Steve. What's it take to be a broker? Yeah, uh, great question because I know a lot of people are interested in becoming mortgage brokers for a decade. I coach specifically brand new to industry brokers. My advice to anybody I think that would like to join the industry, what I found is a commonality or a common passion amongst people that want to become mortgage brokers is a passion in property. So that's pretty common. I would say if you want to become a broker, don't do it alone. There are many good brokerages now where you can come in on a career pathway that will lead you to broker, but the best brokers are going to be ones that know the business inside out, Steve. If you don't want to do that, so you have a burning desire to be a solopreneur broker from day one, then I think you need 100 grand under your belt, seriously, to start. The money doesn't come through as quickly as it does in real estate. You don't have guaranteed payments or debitable retainer structures and mortgage broking if you're doing it alone. It'll take you a year to earn a decent, mon a decent money. So if you don't have that, find a brokerage and cut your teeth the first two to three years learning the ins and outs of the industry. I think it's always important to get in sort of really, but myself, I would go in under the, the guidance of somebody who's already experienced and learn it because I guess you could waste a year learning it <laughs> and have been doing it wrong. Um, I guess the, the question then too is, they've been in the industry, so your, your brokers that you deal with, and obviously a team, I see you all over LinkedIn and social media, you, mean, you typically deal with teams with what, four to five, staff um, and then you help them grow their brand and I guess the main question is there, what does it take to be a successful broker? Yeah, there's a few elements in, in becoming a successful broker. So I yeah. do, I'm sort of known as the awards coach. Mm -hmm. Their businesses will say to me, what I'd like to do is how do they get up there on the award stage? What are they doing in their business mm -hmm. um, that I'm not doing that I'm not there? So whether they intend to pursue that um, in their business or not, striving to be an award-winning business is definitely a key to success. Now, um, on that, it's more than sales and profits. You also need to have a pretty killing, killing strategy and you need to know your target market and you need to be brave enough to specialise too. 
And I think they're all elements. And then translating that to brand awareness and brand story is what actually makes a successful brokerage business. So brand desire, also a passion to succeed. Yep. Um, probably, I guess, the more important question, the elephant in the room is, you guys, how, how did you meet? I actually reached out to Therese. So my, my story is, is a little bit different in that I did go the solopreneur route. Mm -hmm. um, and in hindsight, Therese is probably right. It, it does make it a lot easier if you do go under the banner of someone else and, and learn the ropes. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you do go the solopreneur route, it's really, really important to have a strong mentor. And I reached out to Therese on the back of some <clears throat> recommendations and, I, and publicity that I had seen in terms of other mortgage brokers that she, she had coached to win awards and, and be successful in, in the business. So I, I reached out to Therese and, and we, we had a conversation. At that stage, I was very much at the start of my mm -hmm. business journey. So Therese referred me to Sue Hayter, who was another lady very strong in the mentoring business. And, and we've just sort of forged a, a friendship and connection from there. We've stayed in contact, what, what, three, four years? Yeah. Pre-COVID, during COVID and after. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and, and Therese is always very kind and very generous with her time in terms of feeling any questions that I might have and, and helping me along my journey still. You kind of have a property background too, is that correct? So, that's, that's right, yeah. Um, so you did mention property as well. So I think the, the key to making money in real estate is actually being in the business of real estate. Um, do you want to just touch on a little bit about um, your experience in, in property prior to being a broker? Yeah, so my background was both numbers, well, numbers, people and property. Mm -hmm. So I, I started as an accountant many mm -hmm. years ago working at, at EY and then worked in a HR in financial services. And when I lived in Singapore for eight years and my husband and I started a business selling Australian property off the plan to non-residents and expats, mm -hmm and acknowledge the fact that it might be useful to also have a finance business to support these investors who are looking to purchase. So I started this business back in 2016 mm -hmm. as a director and we hired people to work in the brokerage at that time. And then when we moved back to Australia, that's when I decided to get on the tools and, and start the brokerage myself. And nowadays, what I guess, um, I mean, Therese, you've been focusing on niches. But what's, what would you say your niche is now, Adele? I still do a lot of work. My yeah. business was founded on house and land construction yeah. and first home buyers, and mm -hmm. I still do a lot in that space. Mm -hmm. I think it was the best grounding to have as a broker because typically they're not your vanilla sort of deals. They mm -hmm. come with all sorts of challenges and nuances, and the learnings are huge in that demographic. So I, I still have referrers from that time that are still very loyal to me and, and I still do quite a lot in that space. Uh, so I would say that, yeah, I still do quite a lot in, in and, and also the, the next home buyer demographic too. So a lot of those people that bought years ago, they're sort of looking at buying that next property. So. And with your, um, your experience, do you still prefer new properties over established or which way are you leaning now? It all comes down to the client demographic yeah. and, and, yeah. and what's going to work for them. At the end of the day, one of the many reasons I got into broker broking and one of the mm -hmm. many reasons I enjoy broking is because you're part of that incredible journey of mm -hmm. buying a home, whether mm -hmm. that be established, new or, or an investment property or whatever, however you're getting your foothold in the property market. You know, it's not lost on me the level of responsibility that you play as a mortgage broker of helping people get into that. So whatever it takes for them to get in, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, often the, the new builds are easier as far as the, the duties and, and the savings with the grants and, mm -hmm. and all that sort of sort of thing, but um, just whatever it takes for them to, to buy their home. I guess another question for you is, when you're not brokering, um, what are you doing with your clients when they're, they're not on? They're, they're not buying an investment property. What's some good practices that they should be adhering to to set themselves up for their next property yep. or investing in? Yeah, so I do a lot of education via social media videos yep. and, and whatnot, just keeping people abreast of what's going on in the mm -hmm. market. But as far as my actual client database goes, mm -hmm. I'm regularly in contact with them, whether it be quarterly, six monthly, just to listen to what their next mm -hmm. goal is. And even even clients that haven't bought, I have what I call a home loan ready plan. Mm -hmm. And I have a number of clients that are on that now. And they're clients that have come to me and said, I want to buy and we go through their circumstances mm -hmm. and it's, well, you're not quite ready yet. And, and this is why, but if you follow this path for the next however many months, you will get to that objective. And, and I've had clients that have been with me for anywhere from three months to, to two years and just to realise that goal. It's amazing. You seem 
obviously watch out, Therese sounds like a coach. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> no, but it's, you're mentoring your clients and we, we mm. do focus a lot about relationships. Um, what I'd like to do, Therese, I'd like to ask you about these niches. So mm. would you like to give um, our audience a few examples of, of niches that a broker should focus on or could focus on? So what are some of the niches nowadays? So you've got off the plan, you've got uh, specialists, you've got commercial finance. Yep. Uh, what are some of the, the categories of finance brokering that exists? So, and I'll go say from some of the businesses I've coached. Yep. So you've got, um, say, Medico. So you've mm -hmm. got um, brokers that specialise in that space. Mm -hmm. not, so not only they do that, they also know where their market hangs out. Mm -hmm. So they will attend conferences. They'll be the only brokerage that's there. So they own the space. Their messaging is targeted to in particular properties that qualify for mm -hmm. self-managed super fund in the medical space at the moment, that, mm -hmm. that's really hot. Um, so if you know, so that's a really good niche. Mm -hmm. And typically at the moment, that medico niche is also likely to be a millennial market and likely to be not born in an Australia market. Okay. So that then stretches out and ekes out into um, brokerage that specialise, for example, in Southern Asian communities. Mm -hmm. So Nepalese, Sri Lankan, Indian are also capturing and crossing over into that medical and professional level. There's brokers that specialise in IT industry, mm -hmm. so you can do that. You can specialise by locality or geography, depending on what might matter in the city of Albury, for example. You would want to be all things to all people and probably mm -hmm. a little bit more knowledgeable about agri-products and business finance. So I think there that I would think about um, the audience that you resonate with more closely and where you truly add the most value, the greatest value to the problems that exist for that cohort. Okay. But you need a little bit of agility. So Adele would know too, there was a time when home building wasn't a lot of fun if you no. were a broker, right? <laughs> yeah. So if you're just <laughs> you all in on that, that one market, you've got to be agile enough to go, now what else do I also need to um, specialise in just when e an economic downturn happens in one market. Mm. And Would I did go through um, that. And, and yeah, a good story maybe to share about that. Yeah, yeah. and I did go through it. And, and going yeah. back to what I was saying before, my business was founded on house and land first home buyers mm -hmm. and it was very buoyant during 2020 mm. and 21 with the you know, home builder grant and all that free money that was being thrown at people to buy homes. And low Turn interest rates. Turn the market rates. upside down. Yeah. <laughs> and, and low interest <laughs> and low rates. And low, yeah. very, very and fixed easy interest <laughs> rates. <laughs> and all that kind of thing. And then, of course, you know, in, in early, well, in 2021, 22, the, and, and that all started to slow down. And I had put all my eggs in one basket. And that was another time I turned to, re to Therese and I, I explained my dilemma and, and I needed to reinvent myself and, and do something completely different because I had been very fortunate with the referrers and the business, business was coming in and, and I had to diversify. And, and I think that's one of the important lessons that y you initially, you know, I would encourage everyone to say yes to every deal because that is where you mm -hmm. learn and that is where you will find what your demographic is and, and what it is that you Agree. want to specialise in. And then if you convert that into your marketing and, and as Therese said, find your target audience and, and market it in that way, it, it takes time, but it will come. I heard something too, I would actually read that if you had no marketing that existed, and you just focused on the one client that was in front of you and you serviced, um, serviced them very well, you then focus on your next deal, which is your referral. So that you're basically learning as you go. You're laying one brick at a time um, and you're learning there because the, the business really comes from referrals. It's mm -hmm. still built on relationships. Uh, it's still bet on, um, built on mindset. And I think a lot of things that scare people is, is really understanding money. Uh, it's a whole other topic that we could talk about and the mindset around money. But I'd like to sort of finish off just one question, okay? For the, uh, for the viewers out there, what's, what's one tip or something you'd want to share that you feel that the, the person either getting into property or wanting to become a broker, what should they do next or, or what's the one tip you'd like to share? Start with me? Yeah, sure. Um, I think my one tip is really to check in and see how big your brave is because if you're going to do this you are going to get not from pillar to post there's no easy journey so if you're truly truly passionate and structurally you've got everything in place like a year's salary how big your brave is be honest and if you can answer that and it's big then go for it love it i think surround yourself with good people um, and no matter what stage you're at in your journey, there is always someone better than you and has done it better than you and bigger than you. And, and again, pivot as you grow. 
Um, and also just, just never give up. There, there are times that things may feel slow and, and it, it can get lonely and, and it can get challenging, and especially running your own business. But that's where it comes down to, again, surrounding yourself with good people and, and just and never giving up and, and just always putting in 100% because it, it does come. And the, the, other, the other point going back to what you're saying about the clients is treat everyone like gold dust. Because if you treat everyone and make them feel special, even if you don't write a loan for them, they could go out and tell 50 people, well, I didn't get my loan, but she was amazing. And that's the best marketing you can have. Love it. <laughs> very, very passionate. Look forward to having you back on the new property show. Thank you, Aunt Therese. Thank you, Adele, for joining us on the new property show. Thanks so Thanks, much. Thanks, Steve. On today's segment, we're going to be discussing the Hatchaway Investment Property. We've talked a lot about this over the last several segments, but today we're going to deep dive into it. So the definition of a Hatchaway Investment Property is a property we we'll buy for the sole purpose of making capital growth while that property still covers its expenses, including its loan repayments. So that property is generally one that has cash flow positive. Generally, we're gonna be putting it under a trust, like we talked about in other episodes. And generally, we're gonna be holding onto it for a five, 10 year period. The longer we hold onto a property, drastically increases the chances of having a capital gain. So we wanna be able to hold onto a property for five, 10, 20 years. And this is where the strategy comes into it. When we look at a Hatchway property, we want to look at a rental yield of 7 to 8%. We want to be buying in a suburb that has good capital growth over the long term. We want to be looking at what key indi indicators are going to result in this property outperforming or performing in line with the market. Because what we can learn from history is the longer we hold on to a property, the more capital growth we're going to have. We'll take you back to 1970s. In 1970s, the average house price in Melbourne was $12,800. Interest rates were around 5%. And over the next 20 years, we had a massive inflationary period. That resulted in house prices going all the way up to $184,000 in Melbourne by 1990. And remember, interest rates were peaking around that 18, 19%. So think about that, that's a 13, 14, times your original investment if you're able to hold on to that property for 20 years. That is so powerful, which is why we want to make sure that we can hold on to a property for the lifetime of it. With that in mind, we don't want to be buying an investment property for one, two, three years. We don't want to buy a property that has negative cash flow because it may result in us selling it prematurely. One of the big mistakes that I've seen investors make over the last 10 years is that they sell a property at the wrong time and generally because of factors outside of their control. They may have a loss of job, business underperforming, or other life, unexpected life events that cause the person to have to sell the property at the worst possible time. So the Hatchaway property is one that's gonna have high cash yield, which means that you won't be forced to sell it when an unexpected event happens. I'm Gary Brown, keep learning and take control of your financial future. Dax, uh, welcome to the new property show. Thank you for, uh, for coming down. Uh, today's topic is uh, duplexes, property development, and how you help your clients. Mm -hmm. um, you've been in the property industry for a while now, but um, you want to just talk us through what you do? Yeah, Steve, good to be on the show. Good to be here today. So it's a bit of a journey that we've taken our clients through over the number of years because the markets have been changing quite a lot. And you, you know, as you know, over COVID, a lot of equity growth, which was great, uh, but now some of the markets are flattening off. So you've got to find different ways to make money in this market right now. And one of the ways we work at, and you hear a lot on your show, you know, yields and equity. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that we focus on is manufacturing equity. And that's really key to a lot of my clients' portfolios. You know, manufacturing equity, it means you, you're creating something new. You're either putting a granny flat out the back mm -hmm. or you're subdividing or you're finding something old, you know, a classic, you know, we were buying a lot down in Geelong, which had a house at the front with a big driveway and a big backyard. And now they've got the equity growth. They've been able to pull that equity out, put plans and permits in and put maybe two at the back, sell one off and they've got a great portfolio to then leverage into another project. So that's where we've led right into subdivisions and we've been focusing a lot in the New South Wales coast, mm -hmm. coastline between Sydney and Byron. Um, a lot of people have been doing sea change, 
tree change and it's been fantastic. We've only targeted certain coastal towns that have got good infrastructure, good government spending, good jobs. So you've got to do the data first to make sure you've got the right area to go into and then target the right size of land, right frontage, find something old, we may bulldoze it or keep it like I talked about. But you know, we're, we're getting some great results for our clients and they're able to leverage off the first one into the next one and the next one. So do you need to necessarily do all the builds at once or sometimes could you just start with buying a block of land mm -hmm. and then just do the first build and then revalue, build the second one or is it more economical to really do the builds, both builds at once? It's a good question. Yeah. It really depends on your budget and your strategy. Mm -hmm. And we always go back to strategy at the start and go, mm -hmm. okay, a lot of my clients have either bought their home and another investment property, maybe a beach house mm -hmm. or a couple of properties. And we really want to assess that first and see if we can actually squeeze more equity or yield out of it through just renovations mostly, you know? And then, you know, you can see if you've got the equity to go again. And if you've got enough to do the whole project straight away, it's much more advantageous, advantageous <laughs> to do that. <laughs> but the, the key thing is, holding the land until you've got enough equity to go and do that, you know. So sometimes what you might do is, some of your clients obviously you're dealing with for years, but mm. they might be purchasing something now and it might be two or three years before they do the build. Um, so these coastal towns, like, do you want to just run us through some numbers? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and obviously I'm down in Vic. Mm. Um, Sydney's a whole different market for me. Mm. Uh, what's the cost to buy a, a property up in between Sydney and Byron Bay? What, what are you spending? Look, you should have a budget for the whole project, mm -hmm. about 1.1 to 1.7, okay, for the entire project. That means mm -hmm. land acquisition, plans yeah. and permits, and the build. What that would get you at the low end, mm -hmm. probably 200 to 250K profit mm -hmm. at the end, and that can be 18 to 24 months. But the top end, if you're at the 1.7, you can make about half a million dollars on that, which is fantastic for my clients. And if you can do that, and then have that half a million dollars ready to go for another project and another project. Uh, we had a client recently, he bought one, finished it, he sold one of them because as a duplex, mm -hmm. you're subdividing down the middle and building two. He was able to sell that one, have enough equity to go again without putting any more money in. So his initial deposit on the first project, that's all he's had to pay. And our plan for him over the next 10 years is just to keep doing that duplicating it, manufacturing equity, putting your, you know, sometimes they call it sweat equity. But yeah. It's when good. you're coaching your clients, hmm. um, are you working with them face-to-face -face Zooms or you're working with spreadsheets? So what are some important elements that they really need to understand before, I guess, engaging your services or actually taking action? Hmm. Uh, what, what do you think is most important for them? <laughs> yeah. We've talked about this many yeah, times before, but mindset is yeah. key. Yeah. yeah, and you can really feel it a lot. Uh, recently, I just had a client um, and we were chatting to him and his wife over Zoom. They were a Perth client uh, and they were, um, he was talking about, oh, property, you know, I didn't do really well. I made, I bought a property and I had to sell it for the same price after seven years. Oh, I don't like it. You know, and the wife was fantastic. She understood the process and everything like that. And it was a really difficult conversation to have with them to say, okay, just... For us to work together and be successful, we need to work on that mindset because if you're talking about negativity in the marketplace, what do you attract? Negativity. So it's really key to get that nailed first. Um, okay. And what would you say is the most exciting thing uh, about what you do? It's all exciting. <laughs> the whole journey is exciting. Property is really. amazing. Yeah. You got to, you yeah. know, if you love it, you yeah. get into it, and you're doing it on your days off, and you're just researching and finding this sort of stuff out. Clients like that that love that, and we back it up with all our data and research, and it just amplifies them to understand the whole market, and they make, can make really clear decisions from that. So, getting them excited, seeing them research the data, see their portfolio and go, oh my God, we can make another 200K equity out of this if we do a kitchen bathroom renovation on those two properties we've got. Then we can go and buy a duplex. You know, and you see them once they start knowing the methodology we use, knowing how to improve the assets through sweat equity or manufacturing equity, they love it. And, they can, and you know, we set 20, 30 year goals for our clients you know, and, and to retirement, financial freedom, as we all try to do. When they set those goals, it comes a lot quicker 
It's amazing when you know, go into the mindset, when, when they focus on, when yeah. you write it down and they know which properties to do next, 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 next to get them there, it just seems to compress. And we've just got our first client that's retiring uh, in two months. He's off to Japan uh, to live with his wife and family. Dax, amazing to have you on this show. And obviously we're gonna have you back as a guest and we're gonna talk about some new topics as mm -hmm. well. Yep. Um, but uh, for the viewers, just before we close, what's the one tip that you have for property? Never take your eye off the ball. Uh, a lot of people will buy a property and then think, okay, it's, I'm set for the now. But if you're always on top of it and it's always in your mindset of this is what you want to achieve, you'll get there a lot faster than buying something and just sitting. I agree. On. You should always be thinking about your next one. Correct. Dax, yep. it's been a pleasure to have on the new property show and we look forward to having you back soon. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs>
at, I guess at the home is not an investment, uh, I guess a, a physical investment, but just really just, just keep it like a turnover. It depends yeah. on the circumstances. We have some that we just keep on rent because yeah. you're making a lot of money from that, or it depends on the market. If it's a crappy market, we'll hold on to our properties. Great market, flip, sell, move on to the next one. Mm. So you're just riding it out. Yep. Yeah. What about yeah. you, Karen? It's definitely dependable on how the market's going. You know, with interest rates now, it hasn't been very good. Now it's sort of capped at the moment, but uh, yeah, I'll always look and see how the market's travelling. And, you know, obviously I work with real estate agents and developers on a daily basis. So, you know, I've, I'm lucky to know how it's tracking. And so you just hold it if it's not, um, if it's not the right time. Trees, you deal with, um, I, I guess, like in previous episodes we've discussed, you deal with a lot of brokers that are writing loans really across Australia. Mm -hmm. um, are you seeing people sort of moving uh, out of the state now to purchase their properties? Uh, mm -hmm. is, that sort of, is that conversation coming up? Yeah, it's certainly, I think the majority of my the brokers that I work with are based here in Melbourne, but they will have a, um, a national exposure. Definitely their clients are investing across states and across markets. Um, oh, I don't know, ne not necessarily, I suppose, the mining town, mm -hmm. very small market, but certainly maybe more affordable regional centres of New South Wales and Queensland over Melbourne. Perhaps, yeah. Yeah. And and I think that you? comes down yeah. to affordability too. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know, getting back to your point about whether you buy and flip or, or mm -hmm. whether you, you hold. I mean, mm -hmm. you look at the, those that bought market garden land and whatnot many, many years ago. I mean, mm -hmm. they're worth an absolute poultice now, right? So mm -hmm. it depends on, as you say, your circumstances and what you're buying as to whether you hold it or, or whether you flip it. Um, but as far as what I'm seeing now, I am. I mean, I have clients everywhere. I just did a deal in Alice Springs. I, mm -hmm. I do a lot in Queensland um, and, and in Melbourne. And I am seeing a lot of first home buyers buying in Queensland because purely affordability. Mm -hmm. What about, um, what's your thoughts on uh, the way I was brought up, my, my parents have had the same house for 40, 50 years. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I've been, I'm, I'm anti that, I'm more about flipping and buying and selling. Um, but what about almost the mindset of buying a family home as an investment? So you want to move into it uh, and then develop it. So how long should you stay in your family home for nowadays? Where are you... Are you recommending staying in the family home for 10 years or would Talking you be prepared? For a tax perspective? Yeah. Or? Yeah. <laughs> well, I guess we're touching on that. So, <laughs> um, is there advantages in moving into your own properties and developing? Depends on what your intention is. But yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think they're slightly different mindsets. Yeah. Buying your owner occupied property in the family home is, is you know, you're going to have a very different set of criteria mm -hmm. to buying an investment property. You know, yeah. the, the aesthetics and, and whatnot are less important for your investment, but the numbers have to stack up. Whereas your owner occupied, you know, it's, it's less about that. I think too, though, but the numbers sometimes don't make sense. Like some of the deals that you're doing are in the millions. Um, I personally, from a cash flow point of view, wouldn't recommend buying a five million dollar property to rent out at two thousand dollars a week. You're going to mm. lose money. Yeah, it's not worth it. Um, but yeah. if you move into the property for the perspective of doing an upward development, there's definitely advantages there. 100%. So there's there's two different types of mindset there. Mm -hmm. yeah. And what I want to I guess establish on this show is, is that some of our viewers that are starting here right now, can really be doing these five million dollar deals down the track if they develop that mindset. Mm -hmm. um, I guess what we want to try and get out of here today is. What would your next deal be? Um, right now, you all have a million dollars each. How are we spending it? Jeez. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I know what I'd do. So okay. I'd, again, look at the location. I'd find something that I can renovate and I'd look at the market and flip it. So build, uh, so buy, renovate, flip. Correct. Is that a, a million dollars for me wouldn't be enough for construction costs, so I'd have to find something that's, I'd have to renovate with that money, but I would look in Port Melbourne or South Melbourne. Okay, so you're staying Bayside? Yeah. yeah. Yep. Just because I know it makes money. Yeah, yeah. I think you're right. I mean, a million dollars doesn't go as far as it used to, mm. uh, but I think, you know, for me, it would be an investment and it would be researching those up and coming areas that haven't necessarily hit the market yet but are part of that urban sprawl so it might be a little bit further out from from mm -hmm. melbourne or, or brisbane or wherever but the infrastructure is getting built and it's at a point you can see that it will go so you're a buy and hold yes yeah yeah, I would buy and hold, and I think for a million dollars, I think there's some good buying to be had on a reasonable sized block of land, seven eight hundred and square seven eight hundred square meters, Brisbane, 
probably within eight to ten k's of the city. That might be a house that's maybe built in the 80s or the 90s, but I think for a million dollars I'd get enough to be able to buy that and probably do a superficial renovation, I'd hold. How long for? Um, I reckon I'd do really well if I held that for seven to ten years. Mm. But I, I feel and, like and there's an emotional connection yeah, there too with you. Brisbane as well. I yeah, just feel like for mm. seven to ten years, if I did a quick flip and then kept increasing my money in seven yeah. to ten years, I could be doing many millions of dollars, which is how we've kind of structured our business. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> just seven to ten years, <laughs> I don't know if I'm going to be alive. It's a long time. It's like, a I need Louis Vuitton, yeah. like, yeah. I need yeah. Chanel bags. Like, I don't need seven to ten years. Like, I just feel like with a million dollars, it'd be something that yeah. has to be really yeah. quick for me. Within six months, mm. bang, make the money, move on. Mm. That, But that's yeah. Yeah. me personally. Yeah, that's where I'm at too mm. on that. Isn't it interesting? You guys on the right, you guys on the left. Fantastic. Uh, and that's why I think it's important, though, that we have the right mm. advice. Uh, yes. Most importantly there, what I didn't hear come up in this conversation was interest rates. Because what mm. I find with property is there is money to be made. Yes. Um, and it's really about the deals that you do. Uh, this has been a really interesting topic. <laughs> um, love hearing your thoughts and views. Um, I, love the, I love the million dollar concept. And what was very interesting that actually surprised me his million dollars doesn't go very far. No, it's We'd said a million dollars 20 years ago, we'd think we're rich. Yeah, <laughs> I know. Um, but it's it's all about do with what you can with what mm. you've got and keep getting on the next deal. And your advice is to keep flipping. Quickly. Yours is hold. Um, I think I'm somewhere in the middle. I think about uh, doing as many deals as you can. But also, the only thing I would probably disagree with uh, would be holding properties as you go. So doing maybe two flips, hold one, Two flips we do and that hold. as well. Yeah. We do that as well, but it depends on what's going to make the most profit margin. So if something's not as profitable, we'll put it on rent and wait for the for the market to increase. So we do have that as well. But not seven or ten years. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. And I think also just yeah. going back to your point of interest rates, because I think so many people right now are trying to time the market. Yeah. You know, forget about that. Just get in and spend time in the market, whether it be flipping quickly mm. or length of time. You know, trying to time the market, it's uh, it, it's fraught with caution and very rarely do you win. I think too, having the right team around you is so important. As mm. I said, I, I'd have all of you as advisors uh, because at the end of the day, um, the goal is is to uh, is to build wealth through property. Um, thank you much, so much for joining us today. It's been an awesome uh, debate and we'll see you again thank soon. You. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. And that's all for this week. If you want to see any of our full interviews, go to our website, The New Property Show, or check us out on YouTube. We'll see you again next week.